Welcome to the Macmillan Report. I'm Marilyn Wilkes, your host, and our guest is Stephen Wilkinson, the Nilakani Professor of India and South Asian Studies and Professor of Political Science and International Affairs at Yale University. Much of Professor Wilkinson's work focuses on India and ethnic violence. His book, Votes and Violence, Electoral Competition and Ethnic Riots in India, was co-winner of the American Political Science Association's 2005 Woodrow Wilson Prize for the best book published in government, politics, and international affairs. Today, we'll talk with him about his current book project on colonization, democracy, and conflict. Welcome, Professor Wilkinson. Thank you, Marilyn. Let's begin with an overview of your book and the questions that are at its foundation. So the main question I look at is why have colonies done so differently uh, since independence? Especially why have colonies that seem to be superficially uh, similar, that are French colonies for instance, or British colonies, or Portuguese, um, why given these uh, similarities do they seem to have um, done so differently? in terms of their levels of democracy, their levels of ethnic and other kinds of conflict, or their levels of governance. How did you come to write this book? What was your inspiration? So I think part of it was um, my fascination by the question in India of why India and Pakistan have done so differently since independence. India has had a much happier experience with democracy, with its management of ethnic conflict, uh, with uh, its level of state strength and governance than Pakistan, even though both were part of the same country, uh, the British colony of India prior to 1947. So part of the inspiration is just how do you understand things like that, uh, these differences uh, given similarities within the same empire. I think the second aspect is uh, related to my interest in ethnic conflict. Uh, I've long been interested in working at uh, which kind of systems can moderate ethnic conflict, uh, why some countries seem to have higher levels of violence than others. And obviously in answering that question, it's important to get a sense of where colonies start. Some countries become independent with much higher levels of ethnic conflict, ethnic imbalance than others. And so you need to get a good sense of the colonial legacy if you're going to answer that kind of question. And then the third uh, issue, I think, is um, that the way in which political scientists and economists have tended to look at these questions have used very blunt indicators of the colonial experience. So for instance, they use, uh, were you French or not French? Were you British or not British? Mm -hmm. um, and the fact is that there were enormous differences, not just between empires, but also within empires. So for instance, in the British Empire, at the point of independence, some colonies have 250 or 300 years of experience running democratic institutions. Mm -hmm and other, uh, or um, at least electoral institutions, if not full dem fully democratic, and other countries have had essentially no experience with uh, running de democratic institutions. Some countries are highly ethnically imbalanced, others aren't. So there's enormous variation across these countries that um, I didn't really see out there in the existing uh, work that was being done. And so I wanted to uh, develop better indicators of those kinds of things. Okay, so the data collection and its analysis play a very important role in your book. Tell us about it. Yeah, so in, in data, most of the interesting questions, I think, in almost any field, uh, it's very difficult to answer them with data that are just off the shelf. Mm -hmm. right? There is no free lunch in data analysis. And so if you're interested in, in getting better answers, you often have to just go out and do the hard work of gathering the data yourself. And I'm interested really in the three kinds of aspects of the colonial experience that I think are most important. One is uh, looking at the legacy in terms of uh, party development and electoral institutions during the colonial period. Uh, if you compare different states, how many years of electoral institutions have they had? Uh, what kind of party systems have they had? How much experience with alternation of government? Those kinds of things. The second thing is levels of uh, human capital development, to what extent are locals running the state at the time of independence? In some states, like the Belgian Congo, it's, a, it's mainly Belgians who are running all the higher parts of the state. And there isn't much training and not much capacity uh, underneath that. Whereas in other states, uh, like India, for instance, you have the very top reaches of the colonial civil service are 50%, perhaps, or even more than 50%, people from the local community at the time of colonization. So there's a very different capacity there. That doesn't mean that they were fully democratic, fully free, but still you have different levels of, mm -hmm. uh, of inheritance. And then the third kind of thing 
that I'm interested in is ethnic imbalance. Some states were ethnically much more imbalanced than others at the point of independence. And you could be doing very well in terms of uh, your level of democracy or your level of human capacity uh, training uh, at the point of independence. But if all those goodies are going to members of one group, then you're in for trouble. And that, in a way, is the story between India and Pakistan. OK, so how did you actually get to the data? It seems like a, quite a bit of data um, would be required. Yeah, so um, secondary sources, archival sources, basically going through with a team of research assistants. Uh, there must have been probably 10 research assistants at various points in the project, uh, together with, with me. Um, Working, reading through lots of secondary sources, reading through lots of archival sources on 144 different countries. Wow. You can't look at every aspect of those countries, but you can at least get some sense of how they vary over the most important kinds of variables. I see. So why is it important to look at colonial legacies? Um, I think the most important reason is that they still have a substantial impact on the countries today in many cases. So to come back to the Pakistani case, mm -hmm. Pakistan's army today is very much a product of the colonial period in terms of its regimental composition, in terms of its ethnic balance. Mm -hmm. You cannot understand the role of the army in Pakistan and the composition of the Pakistani army unless you understand um, the colonial inheritance. Nor can you understand why Pakistan has had such a bad experience with democracy compared to uh, India. So in that way, it fundamentally shapes many countries. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the second main reason is because even if, you're, even if you don't care about colonialism, all you're interested in is uh, economic growth or institutions or uh, democracy. Even if you care nothing about colonialism, the fact is that the colonial legacy influences your analyses or ought to influence your analyses of how all these other things work. And if you don't get a good sense, if you're doing a large cross-national analysis of what the colonial legacy was, it's very difficult to come up with good explanations uh, that, are going, that are going to be accurate mm -hmm. on how these other things work, democracy, institutions, unless you get a good sense of the colonial period. I see. Tell us about some of the, some of the conclusions that you've come to. Um, so, in, in ter of course, this is an ongoing book project. Yes, it's I not, understand It's not quite that. finished sure. yet. But, um, one of the big ones, and this is in a co-authored paper with uh, Massimo Onorata, who's from Bocconi University in uh, Italy, is that the longer the electoral experience before independence, mm -hmm. uh, even if it's not fully a free electoral experience in, in the way that we would think of free democratic institutions, the better you're going to do in terms of your um, likelihood of being democratic after independence. So um, the stock of your democracy uh, at the point of independence makes a big difference to how you're going to do subsequently. Uh, one of the second things is just the ethnic imbalances at the point of independence make a huge difference to your likelihood of conflict. Mm -hmm. So you could be doing really well in terms of um, your electoral inheritance, but if you're ethnically very imbalanced in the military, in the civil service, or in who gets access to politics, you're headed for trouble at the point of independence. And then the third thing is that the uh, human uh, capital experience also makes a difference. So just to give you one instance, uh, it's impossible, I think, to understand uh, the Belgian Congo, which is now the state of Congo, and how it's done since uh, independence without um, realizing that a year before independence in the Belgian Congo, they had 5,000 senior civil servants, not one of whom was Congolese. They had an army with 1,000 officers, not one of whom was Congolese. They had 14 to 20, depending on which, is, which estimate you read, uh, university graduates in the entire country of 14 million people, and basically just a few hundred high school graduates as well. This is a country that in all respects is not prepared for independence. Other countries, India has 100,000 uh, students in university in the 1930s. You know, they had much better legacies in terms of where they are at the point of independence. And it's impossible to understand how the countries do unless you get a sense of where their starting points are at the point of independence. Good point. And final question, what uh, was the greatest surprise to you in doing your research? Um, I think there were several surprises. One was that um, many colonies didn't actually make money. Uh, I went into this thinking, um, that many of the colonies were pure exploitative colonies, and I, I think they were exploitative, but the fact of the matter is that a lot of them didn't 
make money. The Germans, for instance, heavily subsidized their colonies. That was one surprise. I think another surprise was um, the way in which countries are not prisoners of the past, that good policy decisions have been able to uh, turn things around in many countries. Tanzania, Singapore inherited very ethnically imbalanced armies, uh, but managed to turn the situations around. Mm -hmm. And more generally, the importance of the individual. I went into this thinking that a lot of the colonial legacies were going to explain a very large part of how countries had done after independence. And I, I think they do. But it's also important um, to realize that the difference between having a Jinnah in Pakistan and a Nehru in India after 1947 also makes a difference. And uh, leadership problems in the colonial period and post-colonial period, just as in our own era, uh, play a large part in explaining the kind of outcomes you get. Good, good leadership matters. Mm -hmm. Very good. Thank you so much for being here with us today and sharing some of your research. Well, thanks for asking me. For more information about Professor Wilkinson and his work, please visit our website at yale.edu backslash Macmillan Report. Be sure to join us again for another episode of the Macmillan Report made possible through funding from the Whitney and Betty Macmillan Center for International and Area Studies at Yale.